Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Julian Armour, and I have the great pleasure of uh, having a, a podcast with one of Canada's uh, top violinists, Alexandre da Costa. Uh, for those of you that don't know Alex, and I'm sure that's very few people, uh, he's certainly one of the most exciting and innovative violinists I know anywhere on the planet, and he always seems to be coming up with new projects, uh, exciting things. He, he's a superb classically trained violinist, so his, his Bach is amazing, and he, and he carries all the way up, and he really believes in the relevance of music uh, to today's audiences, and he's always coming up with new projects. And uh, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, at Music and Beyond, you're going to be playing a concert called Stradivarius Baroque uh, on July yeah. 12th, uh, and it's going to be, uh, I'll, I'll just say right in advance, it's going to be, a, it, it's a very innovative project. Um, and we put it in an amazing venue. We're putting it at the Horticultural Building at Lansdowne Park because uh, uh, we, we agreed it couldn't be in a normal venue. It had to be in a special, a special place where it really goes. So tell us about this program. I want to know all about it. Well, it's a little bit a, a crazy project, uh, and I know it because, uh, you know, I've been working on this for two years, and I wanted initially something that is, was pr parallel to all the very classical and, and, and conservative projects uh, that I had uh, on the table. So basically I kept doing my concertos and, 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 and all the chamber music projects that I, I've been doing, as you know. But on the side, I was having fun with this project that basically took me to jazz, to pop, to electro music. And while playing these, uh, the, these tunes, I, I really got the, the hang of it and I thought, why not make it one of the, the, the main projects that I'm working on right now? And so basically what I did is take music by Bach, Pachelbel, and, you know, Albinoni, all, the, all the, the great favorites from the Baroque era, and just bring them to our time. So I, I, I thought maybe a few of these, uh, these pieces were better with jazz or boogie or pop. And so I invited also a few, uh, a few guests, uh, artists that I, I really love, like Tori Butler, the great jazz pianist. Also a few singers from Quebec that are pretty well known uh, internationally, like Mario Pelcha and Bruno Pelletier. And we, we just had fun with this. And in the end, it gave birth to a wonderful project. And I, I just tried it, you know, to see if people would, uh, would like it. And it was crazy, the, 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 the response from the public, I, I really was impressed because it touched people in a way that uh, I, I don't think uh, I've touched them before. So in the sense that, yes, when I play a concerto, if I play the, the Tchaikovsky concerto uh, correctly, people will uh, like it. It's a beautiful piece of music and, and I'm expected to do it properly as, as a well-trained violinist. So uh, the reception of, of such a concert uh, is uh, something I can predict in a way. But the reception of this Stradivarius Baroque project was not imaginable for me before it actually happened. And, and I, I realized that uh, maybe sometimes classical music tend to complicate things a little too much, and we should maybe sometimes take a step back and just play music for fun. Uh, and, and, and not think about what is allowed and not. So basically this concert's a bit of that, you know, I, I do play classical music, pure classical music, but I do have fun with all those types of music. Uh, there's a bit of, of uh, there's a lot of talking with the public and, and, and you know, laughing about uh, stuff that we normally don't discuss in a concert. So I, a few jokes about Bach maybe and, and, and so on. So I think, the connection with the public is what is most important in this show. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to bring it to Ottawa, to your festival. I'm, I'm a big fan of what you do, Julian, for many years, as you know. And uh, you. I'm, I'm happy that you, you, you gave me a platform uh, at your festival this year to present this new project. Well, tell me, you know, in, in the spectrum of possible audiences, there are diehard classical music fans. And then there are people that have never, ever been to any kind of classical music concert. Tell me how this particular project, Stradivarius Baroque, kind of reaches out to those two groups of people. Well, that you raise a point that is extremely important because we didn't want to uh, not uh, be respectful to the public that comes to my, let's say, normal concerts. You know, I, I want uh, 
everybody that's been to one of my concerts to feel uh, welcome by any project that I present. So uh, there is a part of that uh, Stardivar's Baroque uh, concert or show that is very much uh, classical music and, and I really am prepared as a violinist uh, to present something at the highest level uh, that I can do. So this part is, uh, is very respectful and, and, and in a way it's conservative because violin is violin and, and I, always, uh, I, I always practice with the same amount of energy whether it is for a concerto or a different type of show. But um, we also want people that have never been to a classical concert to not feel fear uh, to, to come and, and you know just, just take a first contact with this music that we know and we appreciate. But it's not so easy for everybody to do this. And I realized this uh, over the years. Uh, some of my very good friends, very close friends, uh, did not consume classical music at all. They were just and when I asked them why, they just said, well, I don't know, don't feel comfortable going to a concert. It lo looks very conservative. It looks very uh, square. And I don't know if I would fit in. And I wanted to take that part out of a classical music show. And so this concert, I, I tell the public at, at, at the beginning, you can clap whenever you want, whenever you please. This is, this is not a concert. This is a show. So please, if you want to scream, you want to dance, do it. No problem. And, and then uh, we just start warming up the machine by um, playing a few tunes that people will recognize for sure. You know, everybody knows classical music. They just don't know what they're hearing. So when they hear the Parabel Canon in a special version, they can recognize it. And so it establishes a first contact that is very effective. And then I can, you know, bring them to new territories. Maybe uh, I'm playing the Bach Chacon, you know, in a very rock uh, setting, but still it's the Bach Chacon. We're talking here about one of the biggest uh, pieces of repertoire for the violin ever written. So, uh, and then people love it because they've been in a way prepared. It's, it's an environment that is uh, relaxed. It's, uh, it's fun. Uh, I, I also had a show where people were actually drinking wine and beer during the show. I thought that was great, you know, why not uh, sip a glass of wine while you're listening to great Bach music. So I think, you know, the, 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 the environment is very important. Uh, so the, the, the contents of the show, we, we take great care in delivering in the, in the highest possible uh, uh, level. But the rest, the, the place that you chose, for example, the venue, very important because I think it's going to it's going to be much more fun for the public to go to such a venue than to a normal, formal classical music venue as we know them. This show in a, in a church, for example, might be a little bit weird, but in a, in a venue like the one you chose, it's perfect. Well, people will be able to order up a, a glass of wine or a beer, and, and you're okay if they're sipping away while you're playing them? Is that the... Oh, they should, absolutely. I mean, this is... This is supposed to be a fun night out, and it's entertainment. I mean, uh, uh, the, the concert is not uh, when you, like when you go to a museum. You don't go to see the uh, art forms in, in the way they were originally conceived. You go to a, a crazy concert with a, a crazy idea of, of taking Bach's most uh, wonderful and, and pure works uh, written and then put them in a, in a jazz setting or in a pop setting or a rock setting. So, I mean, it's very, it, 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 it's very different. And I know that some people might not like it, but I'm sure that the energy uh, will definitely be something that is uh, contagious. So I think uh, even if, if, if I take a look at, at the other concerts that I actually had uh, with this show, I can see that even the people that are used to, to go to very classical concerts do appreciate this new show because they know from the start what to expect. I tell them, you know, from the start, from the first note that I play, and then after I take the mic and say, look, this is not going your, to be your ordinary concert. So uh, you might not like it if you're expecting something pure. So please take off that hat and put the new hat on and, and let's have fun.
Right. Well, one of my passions is trying to figure out how to get people out who have never been to a classical music concert out. How do we get those people out to this show, Alex? Very good question. Uh, we did ask uh, ourselves you know, what to do to, to bring out a new audience, because obviously if we just rely on the classical music audience, uh, first of all, it's not all of the classical music audience that will uh, love this show. Uh, we, we might lost 5%, 10%. And then how do we gain, uh, I don't know, 200% of the, under, the other uh, kind of audience out there that wants to be uh, entertained and wants to go to a, a nice uh, show, but will not necessarily uh, grab tickets for the first concert, classical music concert they, they see. So the exercise was to figure out how to uh, present this. And I think uh, my team and I have, have uh, started some work that is actually, uh, is actually doing re really well. First of all is the media. We, we were going in Quebec uh, in the province. You know, the show, as you know, is not officially out yet. It starts uh, on tour in October, next October. So we're still warming up our, our media machine and, and the way we're going to present this. But, but so far, so good. We have uh, we have had access to the media or a kind of media that usually does not uh, invite classical music in. And, and we wanted to, uh, to connect with the people by just using a few catchy uh, pieces or songs. And then, because I, I am playing uh, tunes like Show Must Go On and Manic Depression during the show and even uh, Dance Me to the End of Love, but I think this is very important because this, uh, these tunes are part of the uh, collective uh, memory. And then when I bring them to Bach Chacon or uh, other uh, pieces that are very important to me and to us classical music players, uh, then it, it's smoother, it's more accepted. And I think uh, also the way we, we market our product, uh, you, you might have not seen the, the new photo shoot, but it's definitely not what you would expect for a classical music album. It's, it's very rock and roll, you know, there's a motorcycle in, involved, a Harley Davidson and, and clothes that actually I don't really wear in real life. But, you know, <laughs> it's just we want to make it fun because it's, it is fun. We just uh, we're not having it's, this is not a serious project uh, in the sense that uh, we're not taking ourselves seriously uh, and, and we're just having fun. But uh, it is a serious project in the sense that we're involving a lot of uh, people, uh, big team, big efforts, uh, of course, big investment. So, uh, and as I said, it's been two years uh, to prepare this. It's, it's much more complicated to prepare such a project than to just uh, uh, prepare a classical music concert because classical music is, uh, although we have a big training and it takes a long time to practice to get to a certain level, it is uh, fairly easy to uh, set up. We just uh, agree on a set of parts, agree on a venue, rehearse together for a few days, and voila. But for this kind of concerts, we, there's a bunch of technical things that can go wrong and did go wrong when we did uh, imagine the concert as first, at first. But now that we have it under control, you know, we have all our machines, it's, it's very high tech, so it's, it's fun. So the big tour is in the fall, and the show is ready. So in a sense, Ottawa audiences are going to get the premiere performance of it, are they? Is that, uh, would that be fair to say? Absolutely. Actually, in French, we call it rodage, which means that uh, you guys get the pre-shows. So uh, we are still uh, making few changes. You, you are, we are still, every concert that we have uh, from now on until October, we try things. So uh, the last concert, for example, I did uh, was a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Tory Butler Trio. It was the first time I would ever play with them, and it was absolutely marvelous. I mean, uh, Tory Butler is a very fine pianist. He's the one that is coming with me uh, in Ottawa. So I, I think the combination uh, between a real jazz pianist like Tory Butler and myself, and then the, the rock elements mixed with the classical elements, I think this makes something that is very, very uh, on, on the, the right line for uh, acceptation from a very big public. So uh, we're still also uh, having a go at technical stuff because, you know, uh, we are our mic. It's amplified. 
So, and, and a violin is not an easy thing to amplify. So we don't want to have a mic on the Stradivarius directly. It has to be somewhere uh, on me. But you, you, we want the audience to not figure out where the microphone is so that it feels like the, the Stradivarius is coming from everywhere in the hall. So it, it's, a very, um, it's a very complex project. But I think once we're absolutely sure of the final uh, you know, the, the final project and how it's going to be done, uh, technically speaking, I think uh, we can reproduce this and it's an expertise that we can keep for future projects as well. Wow. So you're going to be joined by Tori Butler. Who else will be joining you on stage? What? Eric Lagasse, who's the most amazing uh, bass player I know. Uh, he's, he's a professor of harmony at the Conservatoire de Musique de Montréal, which, which tells you that you know, this, this guy's brain is, is out of this world. I mean, he, he can hear things that uh, not ordinary musicians uh, can. And he plays the double bass and he plays the electric bass. So, and he will do both in the concert. So this is very, uh, very, very fun. And then we have uh, Wally Muhammad on the drums. And uh, it, it, it's been said that Wally is the only drummer that is actually... Uh, giving a lyrical voice to the drum so it's and it, it, i can hear that because when when he plays it's like music it's not just like rhythm it's really music so combination of the three of them together they've been playing for 20 plus years together also so they have symbiosis and i'm coming uh to to add the my violin to this uh this wonderful group and it fits perfectly well tell us about your instrument it's a very very special instrument yeah, it is. Uh, it's a Stradivarius. It's uh, built uh, in 1701 by Stradivarius himself. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big gift, actually, because uh, for the next 10 years, I'm allowed to play on this violin exclusively. And uh, the gift comes from uh, uh, one of my very good friends, Guy Deveau. Uh, he, he's a music lover. He, uh, he comes to many concerts. He loves uh, every type of music, but he's, he's a big fan of classical music. And, and when I say fan, I say he's listening to five hours of music uh, daily, and, and he knows uh, probably the symphonies uh, better than many, many musicians, including myself. So uh, I, I have lots of respect for him, uh, and we have lots of fun together. So to play this instrument, which is not only just a loan, it, it's actually a gift from a friend. This changes everything, you know, because I played Stradivarius uh, before, and and when you have an object of, of such a value in your hands, and you're thinking, well, in a year or in two years, I have to give it back. Well, it kind of puts some some kind of distance between the object and the musician. But to know that this violin is is mine in a way for a decade, and I think a decade means something because it it probably is that after a decade of playing a Stradivarius. Maybe it's time for me to give it to some other violinist uh, that is uh, starting a career or a new project. And I think, uh, you know, to be able to play a Stradivarius for 10 plus years is an honor. And I think, uh, I think maybe I should uh, pass this uh, opportunity to someone else after this loan, you know. When do you have to give it back? When's your 10th year up? Oh, I, see, I just started maybe a year. Okay. worry too much about this also Guy is is, yeah. is being so so wonderful he says uh you know is is uh is set in stone could change if you needed more time no problem but i really want to respect this 10 years uh loan in the sense that uh as i said i think this is an opportunity and an honor to be given such a gift i think other musicians and other violinists should have it as well and I, i'm happy to pass on this uh this this opportunity to the next one after me well, it's a, it's a beautiful violin. I know everybody's going to it's going to make this the show that much more special. Tell me about there's a, there's a large uh, technical aspect to this show. Tell me about that. Well, you know, we've tried uh, in many ways. Uh, we've tried it uh, with with no amplification. We've tried it with a lot of amplification. And and to be honest, you know, uh, if we're going to play in in such music in such a setting, we want people to hear a lot of sound, right? Because the, the violin, my violin sounds a lot. And it's a very powerful Stradivarius. But uh, we are used now to go to big uh, centers where you can sit 20,000 people and, and have this huge amount of sound. 
and and I think quantity of sound means something to people because it, it you know the sound just penetrates your body. So if you don't have a lot of sound, you don't connect the same way. That's why we love symphony orchestras because you have hundred people uh, playing together uh, and 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 you know sending through the hall a lot of quantity of sound. And we love this. We love to be uh, completely uh, completely surrounded by this uh, this this humanity or this human sound. So now we're just four people uh, on, on, on stage. We need to recreate this. Uh, it, needs to be, it needs to be something that, that we, we can actually um, connect with. And, and, and it needs to be precise enough that, that it's not disturbing anybody. So I, I don't want people to see, okay, there are a lot of wiring, there are lots of, of, of technical difficulty that we have to to accept for this to be uh, easy on the ear. So we've, we've kind of uh, had to go back and forth to uh, to our, 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 uh, our table and our meetings to find the best way to do this. And, and we did find ways that with Wi-Fi uh, microphones, with bell packs and monitoring in ears. So, I mean, it's very technical. I myself had never used the uh, in-ear monitoring before because we don't need that. We just play the violin. The violin is, is right next to my ear. And I think it's, it's, um, it, it, it's perfect like this. We don't want to have some kind of electronic device plugged into our ears and, and, and not allowing us to be uh, pure. But when you do play with that kind of amplification and you have the drums that is blowing away and the, 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 the piano that you can hear very loudly and the bass that is omnipresent, then you need a little bit of help. And I found this, this, uh, this monitoring, this in-ear monitoring that you just put in your ears and you can hear the balance that you need and, and you don't have to push your sound too much because it's kind of taken care of by the, uh, the microphones that are in place on the stage and on us musicians. Uh, it, it took, believe me, it took a lot of fine tuning to find the right, the right combination. But now that we have it, I think uh, the audience is just going to, to they're actually, they're not going to love it because you, they won't see it. They won't, they will only feel it. So the only mm -hmm. comment they can have is, I liked it or I didn't like it. But it won't say, I liked it, but the amplification was not this and this and that. It's really going to be part of the product that they receive and they can consume it. Yeah. Right. Well, that sounds really great. And there's a, a lighting component to it as well, is there? That's right. That's right. Because now we're, we're so, so used to, uh, to these big shows uh, with that, that are actually complicated and complex. You know, as I said, when you go to a big show with 20,000 people, you expect the video to be wonderful. You expect uh, the, the sound to be wonderful. You expect a lot of people to be on stage. And so we have this show, four people, and we have this, uh, this, the, this great amplification, as we said. But we do have video. And video is there to, to be there to accompany us. You know, just to, it's, it's not a story. It's not a movie. But it's just something that will... Uh, that, that that will actually help the music to be shared uh, between the musicians and the audience. And I have a wonderful uh, video uh, chief. He, he's he's been with me for many years uh, on tour, and he knows when not to disturb the music. So the video is very respectful. Uh, maybe it's it's sometimes it's just colors or uh, some geometrical. Uh, form that, that, that we share on, on screens and TVs and, and in the back with the lighting. But in the end, again, I don't think uh, the audience is going to say, I love the video, but not the music. It's, it's a whole thing. It just, it's together. So you like the show because of the impression it gives you, or you don't like it because you didn't feel comfortable. But you don't uh, pick and choose what you didn't like or what you liked. It's really more of a general feeling, and that's really what we wanted to do from the start. Wow, well, thank you. So my feeling is, I mean, this podcast is largely going to be watched by classical music fans looking at this, but I, I, I know this is a show where it might be the perfect show for these people to say, you know, I've got this nephew, I've got this friend who doesn't really like classical music that much, 
this would be a good show to bring those people out to, would it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, first ever pre-show that I did of this, lots of kids were there. You know, parents came with their kids. I, I told them they could, you know, because it was just a, a first show to, to try it on. I wanted to see what's, uh, you know, what kind of audience it, it, it pleases. And I was super surprised to see that really it's from seven to, to whichever uh, age, you know, and even less because my son is five years old and he was there and he loved it, you know, and, and, and it, it's not a long show in the sense that there, there is never a moment where people say, oh, it, it's a little bit long now because it's, it's all five minutes, seven minutes tops. And, and, and this is what makes it also um, uh, doable because we, we have to have a, a kind of pacing that, that brings us to a, a different musical or a sound environment between the pieces. So we do switch to, uh, to jazz and then to pop and then to rock and then back to, uh, to, to, to something more classical. So I think uh, kids... I mean, not not every kid, of course. I'm I'm not saying that that the show is is for everybody to love, but I think the the great majority of of kids that came to see the show enjoyed it, and and their parents were happy to have brought them to uh, to this kind of show because again, uh, if you hear this kind of show, you think it's probably cool to play this kind of music, and so to have a kid say classical music is cool is always a great thing because uh, he, w he may want to pick up an instrument uh, practice seriously or just go to concerts and, and keep this, uh, this, th this connection to our great classical music throughout his life yeah very nice now I just want to change the topic a little bit uh, you know Alexandre you've got uh, Portuguese blood in you which means you're a, a, a man a world traveler and wanting to get out and move and you're often paying attention and bringing to my attention other people that uh, that you think I should hear and one was the Orava Quartet who just oh. were signed by Deutsche Grammophon and that was your recommendation and I certainly looked in and said wow these guys are amazing tell me a little bit about this group well I met them in Australia because as you know I, I lived in Australia for four years they're wonderful people they're wonderful young musicians. And I'm not saying just young because of their age. I'm, I'm saying because they feel young. They, they, they play young. They, they, they have a different um, look to classical music than in other parts of the world, like, like Europe, for example. And I think uh, it's very much connected with Australia itself. Because Australia is a young country, uh, as, as Canada is, of course. But... Uh, it's different because it's isolated. So we are very um, connected to the United States. We're so, uh, you know, we're, we're close to the border. So everything that happens uh, in, in the south, and, uh, south of Canada is, is uh, very much uh, influ influential to our, what we choose and what we present. But in Australia, they have a different set of influences. So they have Asia that is nearby. They have this connection to the UK that is very, very present. Uh, there is this connection to the rest of Europe as well, because in a way, classical music uh, in Australia is also very conservative um, and traditional because they are so far, so they don't want to keep, uh, they, they don't want to lose this connection with the old world. But um, what I love about Australia is that it doesn't put you in a box. It allows you to try stuff because, you know, uh, this is a big island with, and, and every Australian is, is like a brother in a way. So these guys used this environment in their country to try new stuff. When they play, uh, they look, <laughs> they, they're very uh, much fun. They do look like uh, four Australians. You know, you would, you, they're the kind of uh, image you would expect from four guys, you know, from Australia. They surf, they, 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 they're going to the beach, they have those beach concerts and everything. And so this refreshes everything. Their look is very uh, well studied. I mean, in, in the sense that uh, I've never seen the Orava Quartet, you know, play in, the, in, in black plain suits. They're always fun to watch, you know, with the fun sucks. And nevertheless, you know, what they, what they deliver is very high level music and, and their focus is on the music itself, but they, it's not like they forget about what we see and what we feel just because they're playing uh, famous quartets. So um, I, I very much love this approach. I think 
the future is there as well because without the human connection there is no uh, uh, there's no sharing the music or the emotions and I think this is where we're going we're you know in in 2019 we, we're all about um, feeling something we're all about making our lives uh, more relevant so uh, if we just listen music for, for the sake of listening music, it's not enough. We want to know who's playing it, why they're playing it, why are they choosing to do it this way and that way. And I think the Orava has understood that very well. And uh, Deutsche Gamophon is a big, big label. They don't sign uh, anybody just like this. It's very difficult to get a contract from uh, this very prestigious label. And they've got it. The first Australian group to ever have been uh, uh, signed on, on this label. So. We're, we're lucky to, to have a visit of the Orava Quartet uh, in Canada. They will visit your uh, festival twice. So I think this is, uh, this is a treat for your audience. And you'll see it. They're, they're fun guys uh, to listen to, both when they're speaking and when they're playing. Yeah, they're, and just to emphasize, these are really first-rate players. It's a, it's a oh, really absolutely. fine group, but they bring a, an absolutely fresh and, 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 and I think, yeah, I think there is something that, that reflects Australia, that kind of almost rebellious front to it, but, but, but with great discipline. So uh, they'll, they'll be playing twice on the 5th and 6th of July at Music and Beyond. So absolutely don't miss the Arava Quartet. And don't miss uh, Alexandre Costa, who's playing on July 12th. And I just wanted to... to sp- finish this uh, podcast with a, uh, you've got this wonderful quote uh, and by the way it, Al- alexander if you, if you don't know much about him he is a juno award-winning violinist he won a juno for classical album of the year uh and and uh, i think he's been up for nominations several times and, and put out so many absolutely superb uh, discs but you've got a quote i absolutely love Thanks. and i think given the fact that the show uh, is based around the violin i thought i would read it, it said when i play my instrument becomes the extension of my soul. I think that's such a great mm. quote. So uh, thanks, don't miss Julian. Alexander Costa. And thanks for taking the time to chat. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Julian. Okay. Have a great festival. Okay, thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye.